Happy Friday, folks. Senior Editor Mackenzie DeLulo here, and welcome back to the Texans Weekly Roundup podcast. This week, the team discusses protesters escorted out of the Capitol after disrupting consideration of the House's child gender modification ban, an illegal alien arrested on suspicion of murdering five people in Cleveland, Democratic Congressman Colin Allred announcing his campaign to unseat Republican Senator Ted Cruz, former President Donald Trump weighing in on Texas's appraisal reform debate, Attorney General Ken Paxton investigating COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers for deceptive trade practices, the Save Women's Sports Act receiving contentious testimony in a House committee, a Palestine City Councilwoman running for mayor prompts a new ordinance with candidacy threatening deferred taxes, political controversy in Palestine as mayoral candidates defend themselves from criticism, Power grid regulators send a message to the legislature that more dispatchable power is needed. A border security rally at the Texas Capitol, complete with a Ted Nugent performance. The Senate approving a standard policy for human sexuality instruction in classrooms. And the House passing a bill to raise standards on law enforcement for civil asset forfeiture. As always, if you have questions for our team, DM us on Twitter or email us at editor at the Texan.news. We'd love to answer your questions on a future podcast. Thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Well, howdy folks, Mackenzie here with Brad, Cameron, Matt, and Hayden all sitting in their designated spots as usual. We have a lot of news to jump into, so I'm just going to jump right into it today. Cameron, wild week at the Capitol. Protests, police escorts, and a point of order over a bill to end child gender modification really did result in just a wild day on the House floor. You were there. Tell us what happened. Yeah. So even prior to the debate even starting, the halls were just filled with activists and protesters, and they were chanting and singing right outside the chamber. So I knew we were in for a crazy day. And what what we've seen in some other state capitals, like in Tennessee, I had this inclination that, you know, there was something in there, something was going to go down. So we were, me and Brad, we were sitting in the press box and you could see the gallery was starting to fill, but there was a really a stark contrast to the activism that we were seeing Um, because there was two sides of the SB 14 debate that was going on. The pro-gender modification protesters, they were dressed quite outlandishly. Uh, to say the least, but the grassroots uh, Republican conservative activists, they were all wearing red T-shirts and just kind of sitting in these small groups yeah. peppered around the, the gallery. And so... Um, well, actually, I would say the Republican side had taken up most of the gallery. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it was interesting to see the contrast between the two protests that... Um, were starting to fill the gallery. So that was even prior to the debate. So uh, what set off all the commotion? Yeah. Let's get into it. Yeah, tell us about Uh, it. So as soon as uh, Rep. Tom Oliverson began to lay out the bill, a point of order was called, which caused a mad dash of all the legislators uh, to huddle at the speaker's desk. And as soon as that happened, protesters stood up, started yelling, chanting. Some of them snuck flags and banners into the chamber, draped them over the railing. Um, and you could see the there was a large police presence there because they sort of understood that something like this might happen. So as this commotion was going on in the gallery, police were coming in, trying to escort people out. Well, yeah. so it started with one protester standing up and shouting. Okay. And that was seemed to be kind of the signal to all the other ones right. to start standing up and shouting and unrolling their banners and whatnot. What were they shouting? Um, was, that, was that trans rights or human rights? Is that, is that, that was that? one of them. There oh, were okay. multiple things. There was one, why are you so obsessed with us? And that's what the, the banner, said. The banner yeah. said as well. Yeah. And uh, then we heard after a couple minutes of that the speaker ordered the gallery to be cleared. Yeah, he ordered the gallery to be cleared and the police came in. They really did do a good job of getting everyone out of there pretty quickly, to be honest. But And it was everybody. It, it, was wasn't, every- it wasn't just yeah. the, the protesters. Yeah, and there was lots of video of, of people that you could see online that uh, were from these grassroots organizations, the Republicans who uh, were like, we have to leave too. 
we're not doing anything. And they're like, yes, everyone has to leave. Everyone has to leave. So, uh, the protests continued outside of the halls and some of the, uh, protesters, uh, the anti SB 14 people got a little rowdy, yeah. started getting a bit fiscal. With well, some in of the, the <laughs> in the gallery before everyone got out, there was one guy that was, um, arrested in the gallery. Yeah. And you kind of heard, I kind of heard a, a thud looked up and there's a guy, uh, kind of bent over uh, the, the chairs mm-hmm. and being handcuffed. And right. then he was escorted away. I was told, um, a couple hours later afterward that somebody, uh, swung at a cop. I don't know if it was that guy or someone outside the gallery when more stuff happened, but that was kind of the onus for why the force was being used. Yeah. So, and this was before we even figured out what the point of order was about because <laughs> this was yeah. all going on in the gallery. All the legislators are huddled around the speaker's desk. So, And real fast, remind our listeners what a point of order is. It's a procedural maneuver to point out some flaw in the bill, the bill analysis, anything pertaining to the bill. Um, and if if it's found, if it's, it's sustained, very technical. yeah, yeah, if it's sustained, um, then the bill is would be recommitted to committee, and so they can fix the issue. Um, and well, this one was very technical. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened is because on the bill analysis there was a name of a group, the College of Pediatrics. Pediatrics, American College of Pediatrics, American was what was Co- written. Yeah, yeah, and it was actually pediatricians that it, and so this small clerical error on the bill analysis was the point of order that caused everything to go down. Where now the bill was sent back to committee. It was already voted out of committee. Now it's going to be very quickly, very yeah. quickly. Now it's already scheduled back to be heard on the House floor. This Friday. So when this goes out today, yeah. That's right. So, so. today, to all our listeners. <laughs> yes. um, so everything we witnessed uh, this week possibly could happen again. So um, And another wrinkle to this is that ahead. if it passes on second reading, third reading will be th- on Saturday, a weekend. Well, yeah, on Saturday when no one's working. Right. So... Who knows how many people <laughs> could show yeah, up? That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we're we're going to keep covering this. This uh, this is a bill that's very important to both sides of the argument, and um, something we've been on top of. So, yeah, we'll we'll be there Friday. We'll be there Saturday, and we'll keep everyone updated. Ima- imagine being the person, and I don't know who it would have been, who wrote what was it, pediatric instead of pediatricians yeah imagine being that person Oof. right now and thinking about that Oof. no brother madam speaker yes it's, uh well for what purpose sir point of order oh lord <laughs> <laughs> um okay well uh cameron thank you so much for your coverage of that um hayden let's go ahead and jump to you an illegal alien was on the run for several days after he allegedly shot five people to death in cleveland here in texas including an eight-year-old boy who is the suspect Clearly a very tragic case in San Jacinto County in Cleveland, where uh, five individuals, including an eight-year-old boy, were shot to death, uh, allegedly by an illegal alien from Mexico who used an AR-15 to kill these five people after a family asked him to stop shooting a gun in his yard because there was a baby sleeping. He immediately fled the area. And a four-day manhunt commenced with state, federal, and local authorities offering an $80,000 reward for his capture. There were billboards being put up all over the state of Texas, and the governor's office as well as the FBI were sending bulletins and putting his image out there with tattoos and different markings on his body that would help people find this individual. And he ultimately was captured when the news originally broke that a shooting had taken place. There was also disagreement about whether the five victims were in the country illegally. Greg Abbott said that they were, but they obviously had no role in the situation. They were 110 percent the victims of a horrible crime. And the governor said that any loss of life is tragic. But he did go back and correct 
that there were it is possible that all five people were not in the country illegally that at least one of them had papers and where it was a documented immigrant so uh, that was a kind of a sideshow that happened with this crime uh, ted cruz put out a statement saying he believed the perpetrator should be executed and he hoped that this would serve as uh, a reason why there needs to be stronger border security because the suspect in this case had been deported multiple times on the other hand uh, state senator roland gutierrez a democrat uh, at the state level said that this is a textbook case of uh, Republicans failing to protect the public by enacting gun control measures. And he questioned how uh, uh, the word he used was how an undocumented person was able to get his hands on an AR-15 rifle and shoot and kill five people. So those were some contrasting perspectives on the crime right out of the gate. And that was before the suspect was taken into custody. Uh, but uh, obviously a, a tragic loss of life for these five people. They weren't all in the same family, but some of the reports I saw said that two of the victims who died uh, were killed because they used their bodies to shield young children at the home as this um, evil individual uh, was massacring uh, these these five people. Where was the suspect arrested? He was arrested uh, in Cut and Shoot, Texas, which is in the neighboring county of Montgomery. Uh, the victim's name, excuse me, the perpetrator's name is Francisco Oropesa. And as I mentioned, he was on the run for four days. Uh, the San Jacinto County Sheriff, uh, Greg Capers, said, quote, I cannot begin to express my gr sincere gratitude to all of my deputies, investigators, command staff, ancillary staff, as well as all of the law enforcement officials, agencies, and divisions that provided aid and support during this manhunt. Thank you to all of the citizens that provided tips and support in this investigation, end quote. Oropesa was transferred to the San Jacinto County Jail and given a bond of $5 million that was later increased to $7.5 million. The charge that I have seen so far is first degree murder, which is interesting because that carries a maximum penalty of life in prison with the possibility of parole or 99 years in prison, depending on how they choose to proceed. As I understand it, killing five people in the same crime is multiple murder, which can be charged as capital murder. So I don't know if this is a technicality or if there is some reason they cannot or are choosing not to charge him with capital murder. But right now, the charge apparently is first degree murder. And I will be watching to see if that charge gets upgraded in the future. Thank you, Hayden, for your coverage. Matt, we're now coming to you. Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz will have at least one major Democrat challenger this upcoming election cycle, with the Texas congressman making his Senate announcement on social media. Give us the details. That's right. Congressman Alan Cullen Allred, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, a Dallas area Democrat from Texas's 32nd congressional district, made the announcement of his campaign to challenge incumbent Ted Cruz on a in a campaign video posted to social media this week. Uh, Allred's announcement contains a litany atta of attacks against Cruz, beginning with a sort of a tackling Cruz over the January 6, 2021 riot at the nation's capital, implying Cruz both incited the riot and was a victim of it by, quote, hiding in a closet. Uh, he also poked fun at uh, Cruz's now infamous short trip to Cancun, Mexico during the February 2021 ice storm and blackouts. On social issues, Allred claimed Cruz was uh, wants to outlaw all abortions and cut programs like Social Security and Medicaid. He also slammed Cruz for defending pending le uh, legislation in the Texas legislature to ban sexually explicit material in public schools, characterizing Cruz's action as turning people against their teachers and adding Cruz would ban books. Cruz responded to Allred's uh, announcement with a statement of his own, calling the Democrat a far left radical and uh, with a voting record uh, that is completely out of touch with Texas. Uh, now, Allred wants to, uh, uh, part of Cruz's statement says, Allred wants, to, wants men to compete in women's sports, isn't serious about addressing the crisis at the border, wants to take away law-abiding Texans' guns, and is soft on 
punishing murders. Bottom line, all right is too extreme for Texas. Uh, now, Cruz is seeking re-election to his third term in office. Uh, he was first elected in 2012 after handedly defeating for, uh, former Senator Paul Sadler and was re-elected to his second term after narrowly defeating U.S. former U.S. Representative Beto O'Rourke in 2018. There you go, Matt. Thank you so much. And this is just the first of multiple rumored Democrat challengers uh, that will be facing Senator Cruz. Thank you for your coverage there. Um, yeah, Hayden. You might say that the 2024 race is already heating up. I'm sorry. I just Daniel's not here, so I had to stand in and be the one to make the pun. Wait, I don't get it. I don't either. Colin all red. Oh dear. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Got yeah, it. I, okay. I did not make that connection. I still don't make that. Brad connection. is so disappointed in us right now, or me. I'm sorry. I won't put it on everybody. Madam Speaker, point of order. <laughs> Sir, please bring your point of order down front. Um, Brad, we're going to come to you here. The ongoing legislative feud over property tax reform received a very unusual source of input this week. Who jumped into the debate? Former President Donald Trump waded into the House and Senate's appraisal reform stalemate this week, siding with Lieutenant Governor Patrick and the upper chamber. He tweeted, or truth i should say <laughs> um Tell us about that, this truth, that's his that's his knockoff version of twitter um he said i fully support dan patrick's and the senate's 100k senior homestead exemption and 70k homestead exemption for those under 65 california dade's plan is a disaster for texas house members vote for the homestead exemption 27 bill billion dollar bigger tax cut for, than the house plan so obviously we've talked a lot about the two plans a brief review the senate's focuses on homestead exemptions increasing uh the standard one to 70k increasing the over 65 and disabled one to 30k to a total of 100k that's what he's talking about there um, coupled with an increase in business, personal property tax exemption, and an inventory tax credit. On the House side, they prefer, um, uh, and it, both sides have compression, rate compression in their plans. On the House's side, on the appraisal issue, they prefer reducing the current um, year-to-year appra- taxable value cap uh, that applies to homesteads from 10% to 5% and expanding it to all property and businesses included. So two very different strategies. That's kind of the, the breakdown. And right now we're still at a stalemate on that, but the former president is now jumping into something as obscure as, you know, appraisal reform policy in the state of Texas. So then what did Patrick and Phelan have to say about this? And Preface for our readers to where Trump has come in on, you know, siding with either Patrick or against Phelan previously. Yeah. So Dan Patrick responded saying President Trump joins realtors and business leaders agreeing SB3 by Senator Paul Bettencourt cuts billions more for homeowners than the House's 5 percent appraisal cap plan that will destroy the real estate market. Um It's he mentions business leaders. There are business leaders that supports the Senate um, the Senate plan and oppose the House's plan. There are also businesses, they were especially small businesses, that testified in favor of the House's plan in committee. So the business community is very much divided on this. Um, Phelan declined to comment. Um, I'm not, not surprised by that. He has generally avoided responding to things like this. Um, previously in 2021, Trump threatened Phelan with a primary as rep- retribution for not backtracking and restoring the penalty for illegal voting to a felony in the legislature's marquee election reform bill that was amended in the House from a fel- felony to a uh, misdemeanor. And that was not stripped in conference. Both chambers signed off on that um, as they were pressed for time to f- get this thing passed during the special session. Now, that threat against Phelan was not followed through. Speaker Phelan had neither a primary nor a general opponent in this most recent election. Um, and so he, even if he had, it would have been a long shot even with you know, the, the former president's endorsement. But uh, maybe we're getting closer to a compromise on this. I don't know what exactly that would be, but that is something that needs to be hammered out because 
We have three weeks left. Yes. <laughs> and it needs to be hammered out specifically because the legislature has to pass a budget. And because of all of the money from compression tied into this, it is tied to the budget. And so this is not a standalone policy that can, like, let's say school choice that can be kicked to a special. Um, this is this is tied to the budget. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We've got less than a month left. So unsurprising that uh, the former president is siding with Dan Patrick, his, you know, campaign chair of many years. But surprising yes. that he would choose to opt in on a, an issue as obscure, even though it is very important to Texans. Property taxes yeah. continue to be at the top of mind for yeah. many Texans. Still very interesting to watch this become yeah. so technical. And of course, this is Lieutenant Governor saying, hey, you know, President Trump. I need some backup here. <laughs> him, him coming in strong for the lieutenant governor. So I'm not sure who that's going to convince in the House, but maybe it does. I don't know. It's a core it, of public opinion, though, too. Yeah. Right. That's a big part of how this all works. Yeah. So, OK. Well, Brad, thank you so much for your coverage. Matt, an investigation has been launched into three of the largest vaccine manufacturers, citing a Texas business fraud law. Give us those details. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has announced an investigation into Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, sending them civil investigation letters demanding documents and records. The Attorney General is citing the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act as the legal basis for the investigation, which prohibits businesses from engaging in various types of fraud. In this case, whether they illegally conducted gain-of-function research or misrepresented the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. The three companies will have 30 days to deliver the records or else they may face civil and criminal penalties. With the announcement of the investigation, uh, Ken Paxton released a statement saying, This pandemic was deeply challenging for Americans. If any company illegally took advantage of consumers during this period or compromised people's safety to increase their profits, they will be held responsible. Well, pretty strong words there. We'll continue to keep an eye on that. Thank you, Matt, for your coverage. Hey, listeners, if you're enjoying our podcast and our up-close and personal coverage of the 88th legislative session from the Capitol here in Austin, subscribe to The Texan right now while you're listening. We're not funded by corporate interests or big donors, so we rely on the subscriptions of everyday Texans to keep doing our jobs. When you subscribe, you'll get access to all our stories as soon as they're published so that you can stay informed, up to speed, and ready to vote at the ballot box. A subscription is $9 monthly, but you can save by purchasing an annual subscription for $90. Bucks. Comes out to just $7.50 per month. And as a reminder, new subscribers will get that fake news stops here mug. For more details, visit the texan.news forward slash subscribe or click the URL in the description of this podcast. Cameron, we're coming back to you. Okay. Another piece of priority <laughs> legislation for the Senate is in the House, this time a bill that would require collegiate athletics to compete according to biological sex. Tell us what happened during the committee hearing. Uh, Rep. Valerie Swanson laid out the bill where she identified a variety of different areas that were concerns, such as the supporting research, uh, the physiological differences between men and women, and how it makes sports unsafe and unfair. And these were justifications and the necessity for this type of legislation. So w I wanted to look into some of the scientific research to see if there was evidence of what she identified as clear performance differences based on these physiological differences. And I found quite a robust body of literature that supported her claims, such as articles that found differences in performance when muscle mass and strength are required. Even a study uh, that when testosterone is suppressed in male to female transgender athletes, this research paper found very modest changes and the muscular advantage is only minim minimally reduced. So there is scientific research to support uh, these claims of physiological differences between men and women. Uh, one committee member did question Swanson and made a claim that one in a thousand people are born intersex and what is going to happen with those individuals. When I heard this number, it didn't seem quite right to me. So I wanted to look into it and I wanted to verify if that number was right or wrong. And so, because uh, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding uh, intersex identification and the vagueness of the definition and it's created a wide range of reported statistics. And the best information I could find on 
intersects individuals is from Leonard Sachs, who's a physician and psychologist who studies gender. And he wrote uh, in a paper, uh, a definition of intersex, which encompasses individuals who are phenotypically indistinguishable from normal is likely to confuse both clinicians and patients. So it's a complicated issue. And with Sachs' research, he has found that true intersex conditions in which a person is unclassifiable as neither male or female are very rare, constituting just 0.018% of the population. Important context. During public testimony, was there any, were there any interesting insights? Yeah, one of the most public voices supporting this type of legislation across the country is Riley Gaines. She's a swimmer who lost to Leah Thomas, the transgender male to female, former swimmer from University of Penn, who has been the center of controversy, which has really sparked this national debate. And Gaines spoke about her experience and how she was made to share a locker room with Thomas, who still possesses male genitalia, and how when she has spoken out about this issue, she was attacked for it. And in even one incident, she was held hostage on a college campus by protesters. Wow. Well, interesting testimony in there, you know, certainly a lot in your piece to go and have folks read as well. Mm -hmm. The bill was left pending. Are there any updates? Well, it was just approved and voted out of committee um, two days ago now and uh, will now uh, wait for a date to be placed on the House floor. Thank you, Cameron. Hayden coming to you. The Palestine, 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 Palestine. I, I, I know this. I've asked you multiple times and I still <laughs> messed it up. The Palestine City Council passed an ordinance to accommodate a candidate's deferral of her city property taxes, which is technically legal under the tax code. What prompted the city council to make this decision? State law allows homeowners in the state of Texas to defer the payment of their property taxes if they meet certain conditions. One of those conditions, is, for instance, is if you are a disabled veteran and you apply to partake in this deferral. But another loophole, and that's probably not the fairest word, that is a word that has been used, but another condition that, that can be met is being over the age of 65. And the uh, tax code allows you to defer the payment of your taxes in that case. However, in Palestine, the city charter says council members and the mayor must not have any delinquent indebtedness to the city as city officials. And some Palestine residents said that councilwoman Chrissy Clark cannot be on the council and cannot run for mayor because she had chosen to defer the payment of her property taxes not because she's over the age of 65, but because her husband is. And there was a debate about whether or not this constituted delinquent indebtedness. The city council, at Clark's request, passed an ordinance saying that delinquent indebtedness does not include a legal deferral of one's property taxes under the tax code of the state of Texas. Council members contended that disabled veterans and others who legally took advantage of this provision would be disqualified from public office if they did so. Clark said also that someone who, for instance, was on a payment plan for something like a water leak could also be disqualified, even though there's nothing illegitimate about that. But council members also said they felt ethically obligated to act because they were being threatened with litigation and there was a question about whether she was qualified, so they believed they needed to act to rectify that. However, one of the other candidates for mayor, Mitchell Jordan, questioned at the meeting, and there was a lot of public comment at this meeting, not just from Clark and Jordan and a third candidate, Joe Baxter, but from others. He pointed out that they acted on this measure on the first day of early voting. So people were already going to the polls, the ballots had already been printed, and a fourth candidate, Mike Ezel, has since dropped out of the race. The next day, he dropped out of the race and said that he was tired of the intimidation and the stress. He, uh, But those ballots have already been printed, and the council passed this ordinance on the first day of, er of early voting uh, that her situation, specifically in future situations like it, would not count as delinquent indebtedness. Wow. So then what were some of the arguments against the ordinance? Opponents said that the uh, ordinance was uh, a way to help Clark over the finish line and was 
more or less the city council putting its thumb on the scale in this election and trying to save her from a lack of foresight, not knowing that this could become an issue. And she admitted when she testified in front of the council that she didn't give it a second thought when she was originally making a decision to run for mayor. She said she did not consider her deferral to be a delinquent indebtedness because it is 100% legal under the tax code to do that. There was nothing illegal about what she did. However, uh, somebody the some of the arguments in against this ordinance was that somebody who owes money to the city and does not have a financial stake in the business of the city should not be setting the tax rate and making decisions about the fiscal policy of this of the town. And another uh, councilwoman, uh, Ava Harmon, though she said she respected Clark and respected people who supported her, uh, raised concern that this was creating a perception that there were two sets of rules and Clark was being allowed to run for mayor, be on council uh, when she was not contributing to the financial welfare of the city. But it is important to note Clark said in her testimony that she paid her, started paying her city taxes and caught up on her taxes because she did not want there to be even a perception that there was something wrong or, Ill- or illegitimate going on. So not only did the council pass this ordinance, but there she has paid the city portion of her taxes to correct it on that end as well. A candidate Joe Baxter suggested that there should be a charter review committee. And uh, he and I spoke on the phone and he gave us a statement and said that there should be a November ballot measure with language that uh, says you cannot run for council or mayor if you have a tax deferral. Yeah. So then what does this mean politically, perhaps, for Clark's candidacy? Obviously, from a political perspective, it's not great because she has this this problem with her candidacy before she uh, has even been sworn in as mayor. If she does win the election, Um, she posted on Facebook encouraging people to take advantage of the deferral. So she's seems to be taking the route of I'm not trying to take this special exception just for me. Everyone should take advantage of this if they can. But this was quite an interesting development after early voting started, but before the election is complete. So Clark now had a pretty big political problem in a town of only about 20,000 people where the city council has been called by by other people, a a retirement club, and there was already difficulty at this meeting where they passed the ordinance. The mayor got pretty heated and was getting very frustrated to the point that the city attorney encouraged him to take a recess. And when they got back from the recess, the mayor said that his wife had texted him and asked him to calm down because he was getting too angry with the people who were testifying. So the optics of this whole situation were not great, but obviously from a legal standpoint, the the city council has corrected it. I will say we did reach out to Clark, but she did not return my phone call. There you go. We'll continue talking about this in Palestine, Texas here for a minute. Councilwoman Chrissy Clark had some very interesting things to say about property taxes. What were her thoughts? On more of the substance, uh, Clark did a post on Facebook about the her stance on property taxes. She touted the fact that the city council gave a pay raise to city employees for the first time in three years and lowered the city's property tax rate. She said, quote, why? Because we did our research and determined it was a sustainable decision that allowed our citizens a needed measure of relief while still allowing us to meet our budgetary needs for the fiscal year, end quote. So she's pointing to some of her accomplishments in the council and the low tax rate that was set by the council. Mitchell Jordan defended his stance on compensation for city council members. How did he describe his position? Well, I mentioned Mitchell Jordan before. He is another candidate running. He is a former member of the city council. In the Facebook post by Clark, she shared a screenshot of a post by a former councilman, Will Brule, or Brule, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, that claimed Jordan had advocated for setting the tax rate at the maximum and increasing compensation for city leaders, which is a position that um, Jordan disputed. He sent us a, a lengthy statement and said that he, the council had decided to, quote, retain minimal compensation, end quote, for city council members after this charter, after this uh, research committee met for six months. He said, quote, I respectfully disagree with the position taken by Bruley. 
The city council belongs to the citizens of Palestine. It should be a representative democracy of all ages and ethnic backgrounds, not a retirement club. End quote. He said the compensation that the city council uh, retained is, he characterized it as a, quote, small stipend. And while Bruley had said they should be volunteer positions on the council, Jordan contended having no compensation for city council members means there cannot be a diversity of people from uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds. So that was his favor. That was his argument in favor of retaining that compensation instead of making them voluntary positions. But it was notable that Clark put that a Facebook post out there and she didn't really comment on what Brutally said about Jordan, but she was commenting on the fact that the city council kept the tax rate low and did not increase the the pay for city council leaders, but for uh, all uh, employees and gave them a raise for the first time in three years. So it was a spinoff from, from Clark's point uh, about property taxes. A third candidate, which I love this line, said people are calling him a senile old man. Local politics are my favorite thing. What was his response? Some of the things that happen in local races where you have these these candidates who are trying to be honest with with their neighbors about what's going on. And it's it's very different from big city politics where you have these pristine statements that are that are put out by the press. But uh, Joe Baxter uh, said that there's there are people spreading rumors that he is not mentally fit to be mayor. He's a retired former, uh, he's a retired law enforcement officer. And uh, he said that there are people saying he is a senile old man. And that is the phrase he used. He reminded everyone that he is, has never called, uh, Miss Clark names and he didn't mention, uh, Jordan. So I presume he thinks that it's supporters of Clark who are spreading this rumor. Uh, but he said they're also trying to spread rumors about uh, Mitchell Jordan's financial situation. He said, quote, this speaks volumes about a person. And I hope everyone remembers this when they go to the polls. I'm not senile, but I'm about doing what is right for all of Palestine, <laughs> not just a few, end quote. And I would also like to add just to y'all, I need to let y'all know that I am not senile either. So and there might be question about that. I so. doubt that. I, <laughs> I that's a good fun topic is who is the most senile out of, out of all of us here. I love this story. Hey, you've done such a great job reporting on it. So thank you so much, Brad. Let's go to you for some ERCOT news. The grids regulators have a brief, had a briefing this week on the summer ahead. What did they say? So before every, every season, they provide a um, kind of a report assessing what may lie ahead. Um, the summer one, because Texas gets so hot, is probably the most notable one each year. Um, so in this version, they the general outlook provided by the SARA report is that they expect peak demand to come in just below 83,000 megawatts during summer. The That would be the estimated highest level of uh, electricity demand that uh, that they would expect here. Um, that would be a new record. And I think the record last July was set at just over 80,000 megawatts. So uh, that would be because of, you know, the, the population growth we've had. More, more people means more demand for electricity. So to meet that, the state said it estimates to have about 97,000 megawatts um, of capacity. But the, in overall, they, the report was, was rather benign. They... Um, pretty standard and and not a lot of alarm in the report itself. But the report came with a warning from the grid lake regulators, Peter Lake at the PUC and Pablo Vegas at ERCOT. Uh, for the first time ever, expected demand is outpacing dispatchable capacity available to meet it. So dispatchable is anything that you can flip a switch and turn and start to generate power. Notably, not wind or solar, which are dependent on weather. So. That's a pretty big statement and a pretty big warning. Um, that means that they're going to be relying, as Lake said, we will be relying on renewables to keep the lights on this summer, specifically in the later evening when the sun goes down. Um, the wind specifically will need to produce. And we saw multiple times last session, according to Lake, twelve day, at least 12 days last summer, that wind capacity dipped below 
uh, production and they need like 50% to have a comfortable margin. Sometimes it went down as far as to like 3%, very, very low. So, um, Lake added, in this new reality, our risk goes up as the sun goes down. Uh, there is one scenario in the report, and again, it's, it's a it's a very low risk or low probability scenario, but uh, it is the one scenario that shows a potential power deficit, meaning brownouts, rolling blackouts, extremely high demand, higher than expected thermal outages, and extremely low wind output. ERCOT CEO Pablo Vega said, put the chances of that scenario happening at less than 1%, but it is something they're tracking. How does this play into the ERCOT market reform debate at the legislature? So the grid regulators in their press conference were sending a clear message. The state needs more dispatchable, namely thermal power. Without that, we'll continue to be at the mercy of intermittent weather. The legislature is currently locked in a debate over how to ensure that thermal construction comes to pass. Currently, the piece, performance credit mechanism bill that we've talked about a lot has made it further than Senate Bill 6, which would provide a direct subsidization for 10,000 megawatts of natural gas development. This morning on Thursday, or actually Wednesday evening, the House State Affairs Committee heard SB 7, which is a firming requirement allocating reliability costs to, namely, wind and solar power. Um that got that drew a, a pretty contentious response from the Senate this morning, specifically statements made by these grid regulators in that House hearing. And um, the Senate was going to bat for its uh, firming requirement bill. We'll see where this shakes out. But, you know, I would not have expected SB7 of the three to be the most contentious. Um the PCM bill looks like it's it's moving. Something will happen with that. SB6 looks like it's kind of dead. In it. At least as of the moment, it's not going to move. SB7 is in the middle ground. We'll see what happens there. But we're back at this stage you know, two years later. And that's something legislators expressed a lot of frustration about. Um, we'll see where they fall. Thank you, Bradley. Hayden, Ted Nugent and some other Texas officials rallied for border security outside the Capitol this last weekend. Give us an idea of how the rally went. It was a rowdy rally, oh gosh. to say the least. <laughs> and <laughs> what, what, you're, you're laughing so much. Um, I <laughs> uh, do you like the word rowdy or not well, like the I word did. rowdy? I really liked it. I liked the, the alliteration. I think the word rowdy is fantastic. It ran through my mom. There's a lot happening. Also, oh. you've been you've made really funny quips on the pod today, and I think <laughs> you're just like downplaying how funny they are. My first quip wasn't well, that. I didn't that, that was, love that one. Yeah, but, that one was not my best. Yeah. <laughs> Ted Nugent performed for a crowd of a few hundred people at the state capitol. He performed. Did he juggle? He's a guitarist, <laughs> Mackenzie. Oh, Okay. I, didn't, I did not realize he actually performed. He did. Oh, he, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh. And it wasn't a juggling routine. It was <laughs> a song on his guitar. <laughs> uh, I'm sure point of order. <laughs> Your point of order is respectfully overruled. There were other speakers. This event was put on by Mark Meckler of Convention of States. <laughs> and there were other Texas officials that spoke at this event, including congressional candidate Victor Avila, who, well, he's not a Texas official yet. If he doesn't win, I guess he never will be. But uh, wow, I'm all over the map here. Uh, Chip Roy is a Texas official. He's a congressman. Jason Jones is a former counterterrorism official for uh, the Department of Public Safety. But the event was led by Mark Meckler, and he's the president of Convention of States, which is the group of people calling for a convention of states and constitutional amendments to reign in the federal government. The focus of this event was uh, drawing attention to human trafficking and illegal immigration, as well as uh, drug trafficking, specifically fentanyl. There were some graphic images projected on screens that everyone was warned about. I said I wasn't going to look at them, but I did look at them anyway. They were horrifying and disgusting. And this rally was very much about uh, raising awareness about some of the of the carnage happening at the border. There was a little bit of heckling. Someone tried to 
uh, pass out anti-Semitic flyers and Mark Meckler said from the stage to get the hell out of here, uh, whereupon he did. And there were, so there was a little bit other, there was some more heckling. Ted Nugent got heckled by this one guy um, and uh, Ted Nugent pretty much took care of him and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Great story to go read at the Texan as well and the photos are quite fun. So Hayden, thank you so much for your coverage. Cameron, another bill related to sexual instruction in classrooms and ensuring parental transparency has made its way through the Senate. Tell us about it. Yeah. So as we have seen, many Texas legislators and parents have raised concerns about sexual conversations that are occurring in classrooms and libraries, including discussions of gender identity and illustrative uh, depictions of sex in some of these school books. So particularly with some of the stories we have reported on uh, with Austin ISD's Pride Week and the events they were holding that had to do with talking about gender and sexuality, the book Gender Queer that is still available in some Austin ISD libraries. Well, this bill by Brian Hughes would require school districts to adopt a standard policy regarding the discussion of human sexuality, require teachers to direct students to talk with their parents, a counselor or a sex ed teacher about the issues, and ban third-party groups from introducing sexual instruction material and training that includes sexual orientation or gender identity. These issues are a continued point of contention, and we keep seeing bills related to creating t- transparency or just banning these sorts of discussions in classrooms. How prevalent is sexual instruction in schools? Well, every school district includes sex ed. The issue occurs when teachers and schools are including discussions with their students that is outside the approved TEKS. And TEKS are the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills these are approved by the State Board of Education, and the, these are vetted uh, curriculum standards. Well, uh, what we've seen, though, is just recently an example is something um, we reported on. Uh, a, rural, a rural school district uh, here in Texas had on their counselor resources site a tab for LGBT students that directed them to a resource page that included information on how to join chat rooms with organizations like Planned Parenthood, where adults would be in these chat rooms with students giving them information about all sorts of topics. And so uh, that's just one example of many things we've reported on um, about things that are outside the standards of curriculum that are occurring in classrooms. And so the Senate passed this bill and it will now be headed to the House where it will be assigned to committee. Thank you, Cameron. Bradley, the Texas House again passed a bill reforming the practice of civil asset forfeiture. Give us those details. HB 3659 by Representative Cole Hefner would change the state's burden of proof for seizing and keeping property uh, by the state in a potential um, criminal investigation from a preponderance of the evidence to clear and convincing evidence. That's kind of a a middle point between the preponderance, very low burden of proof, and the beyond reasonable doubt that we see used in like jury trials and whatnot. Um, It puts more onus on the state to prove the allegation. Civil asset forfeiture is the practice by law enforcement officials to, in a, um, in a a traffic stop or uh, an arrest of some kind, to seize the property that they believe was involved in whatever crime they're alleging. And so it's a it's a practice that has been criticized quite a bit. I have some details in the story about like um, dollar figures. I think at fifty million dollars um, in the last in a recent year, I think it was maybe twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one that this law enforcement in the state of Texas seized. Um, $50 million of property. There's more about about the practice in there. Um, Cole Hefner said of the bill, the property rights of Texans must always be our priority and our laws should accurately reflect that conviction. HB 3659 is a significant step forward in civil asset forfeiture reform and will provide greater transparency and accountability. Um, The bill passed the House last session uh, and it did again this session. 
Reminder for folks, if we say SB or HB, that's House Bill and Senate Bill. Yes. Yeah. Just to make sure people know. What did others have to say about this? Derek Cohn at TPPF called it a phenomenal step forward, adding currently the state can take innocent citizens' property without even charging an offense. The guardrails put up by this legislation protect Texans' property rights while still allowing law enforcement to combat real crime. The Texas Municipal Police Association told me uh, about it, too. They said they called it a bad bill, adding that civil asset forfeiture is, quote, a necessary tool for law enforcement to combat criminal activity, and that in 99% of instances, the properties returned to its owner were not weaponizing asset forfeiture to fund our operations. In committee, the breakdown was pretty stark. Um, Every person that either registered testified against the bill was a member of law enforcement, whether it's police or prosecutors. Um, and then on the other side, Cohen at TPBF conservative think tank was joined by um, various progressive organizations. Someone from, for example, someone from the ACLU testified for the bill. A very, a very interesting breakdown of you know the, the debate on this issue. There you go. Well, um, in terms of the remainder of the session, and how much time we have left and the political dynamics at play in the House and the Senate. What are the chances of this bill becoming law? Probably fairly low at this point. A similar version passed last session. Uh, not the same, not an identical one, but similar. Uh, and then it didn't move in the Senate at all. It was referred to Joan Huffman's um, uh, committee, jurisprudence, I think. And it just it didn't get a hearing. Um, it will likely get a similar have a similar fate here. I suppose, you know, hope springs eternal for uh, anyone, you know, advocating this bill. But it uh, it doesn't appear to be something that the Senate much wants to to take up. But it has been a House priority and it continues to be a House priority. There you go. Bradley, thank you. OK, let's go on to the tweetery section of the podcast here. Hayden, why don't you start us off? I don't I'm very curious about yours. I didn't expect to go first, so I'm pulling it up on my <laughs> little tab here. This is this is evergreen. Although this tweet is three years old, it still applies. And the reason I found it is because there's a Stan account for Jim Halpert, which is a character on The Office. And if you don't know what that show is, you're missing out. But Cameron's never seen Cameron's it? never seen The Office. Never okay. seen a single episode. It's not for everyone. I think it's funny. I appreciate the humor. But it's him with the little whiteboard <laughs> meme. And it says... When your advertising interrupts my video, it just makes me hate your product. <laughs> and I agree with that sentiment. That's a good sentiment. I agree with it. Thank you, Hayden. You're welcome. <laughs> I think that the, the meme is amazing, though. It, it, that platform with the whiteboard, it can mm-hmm. be used for anything. It can it, be. And it's uh, for those, it's John Krasinski. He's using an Expo marker and he's pointing at a whiteboard. It's two frames and he's pointing at it like he's explaining. And then the bottom one is just him smiling. Like he made a really good point and he did make a really good point in this instance, but you can put anything on there. I feel like I've seen the office just by the amount of memes that are generated from the show. Right. So that's true. Okay. Well, Cameron, why don't you tell us oh. yours? Okay. Well, uh, everyone was posting pictures from the protests that were going on during SB 14, things from the gallery, things from the hallway, stairwells. And it was going on from earlier than nine o'clock when I showed up. There was already a huge mob of people there. But (laughs) one thing that was uh, pretty funny is, you know, I'm going through these videos, the pictures, checking things out uh, after everything went down back in the office. And uh, Connie Burton <laughs> sends, sends me a video camera. Check this out, and so I'm watching it, and somehow I just appear in the <laughs> middle of someone's video, just uh, strolling along. It looks like I'm just walking straight through it, but you know I'm trying to be a good reporter, you know, stay on the outskirts, you know, not be involved. But in this video, it looks like I walk right through. One of the <laughs> <protests>. <laughs> And I'm like, I was not trying to do that at all. I'm sorry. It's tough when you're trying to report on an event to try to make it clear that you're not participating in the event. Yeah. Like at the rally on Saturday, I kind of ran into the same problem because I had to get into the crowd. Yeah. 
And so I wore my media badge, but at times I would fall back so that it was clear I was reporting on it. But that video was funny because you, you, they were right out, they were in the snake pit, so to speak. So they, you couldn't go to the house chamber in your defense without walking right through it. There was no way to get around that. Well, and they had uh, a podium set up and everything, like walk right in front of it, in front of all the cameras. (laughs) I'm like, I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to find my way through the craziness going on. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that you were caught on video. Um, Bradley, what about you? So as a, a red-blooded American man. Oh, dear. I love the movie <laughs> Gladiator. Yes. One of the greatest movies of all time. And for those of you who don't know, there's a sequel coming up. Why does it feel like when we talk Is about anything pop crow? culture, Brad yeah. like gets on a little like teacher's podium? There's too much going on right now. I can't. <laughs> what were you asking me, Matt? We have multiple pods going on at the same Go time. Go ahead, Matthew. Point I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, isn't that a Russell Crowe movie? Yes. Yes. So... Anyway, um, I saw this uh, tweet from the U.S. Naval Institute this week about Oliver Reed, the actor who played Proximo in Gladiator. He was the wise old sage gladiator. Yeah, he was the old. He he bought Russell Crowe's character as a slave to turn him into a um, a gladiator. Gotcha. Yes, that was his business model. Okay, and he was pretty. You know, profitable at it, I assume. Anyway, so I didn't realize this, but the actor died during the filming of Gladiator. And here's the story of how. Oliver Reed died while filming Gladiator. Reed had consumed eight pints of beer, 12 shots of rum, half a bottle of whiskey, and shots of cognac. I don't know if I said cognac. Thank you. After challenging sailors from the HMS Cumberland in a to a drinking contest in a pub he was arm wrestling sailors when he collapsed oh my <laughs> the most legendary way to go out of this world it was like I've a gladiator yeah yeah you know he he died as he lived yeah very uh one of those method actors you know yeah i uh i'm I'm jealous. Now I have a new mission in life you're jealous <laughs> oh boy that's all hey, when, when the time comes that is how i would prefer to go out okay Although I don't think I can, you know, compete with that. I I'm not up to that level. New Brad quote for the wall. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's something else. Bradley, thank you. You're oh. welcome. Wonderful, Matthew. What do you have? Well, I like following Texas Parks and Wildlife on Twitter, and uh, I just saw this interesting tweet this past week of um, a lady who was fishing out here in Lady Bird Lake, right by downtown Austin, and caught a massive 31 and a half pound striped bass. Uh, they posted a picture of her impressive catch in the boat out there on the lake. I'm not sure why uh, this impressed me. For some reason, I was under the impression that um, the only thing you'd catch in Lady Bird Lake is blink, uh, like the fish Blinky off the Simpsons. But um, uh, this is a very impressive uh, catch. Yeah, that is check a it out huge fish. Holy cow. Yeah. In was, an Austin. Was, was there any follow-up pics of the cookout they had with that big old fish, or did they throw it back? I don't know what happened to it. It didn't say. They just uh, said, swimming around in Austin, this monster 31 and a half pound striped bass was caught from Lady Bird Lake right near downtown Austin. So I guess whenever you see people out there fishing uh, in that lake, I, I always thought that they were not really coming up with anything to speak of, but apparently the fishing's really good out there. So I think I think this would require an investigation. Some good journalism. What <laughs> happened to that fish? Who ate it and who can we, how can we get invited next time? Exactly. Why good weren't stuff. we invited? Very good stuff, Matthew. Okay. My tweet for the week is a video that I was sent this morning by a friend on Twitter. If this lady, it looks like she's in, I don't know where she is, but the backyard, a bear, like a brown bear climbs up on the fence and there are like four or five dogs running around barking at this bear, just yakking up a storm and the bear is swatting down at these dogs with fervor was with, it a cocaine bear i've not seen cocaine bear my husband really wants to watch it and i have not given <laughs> in yet um the but the bear sitting up there on the fence just swatting at these dogs and a woman the owner of these dogs runs toward the bear and pushes him with her hands off the fence grabs her dogs and runs inside it is a heroic 
video. I love it. Pushed a bear with her bare hands. Yes. Just, oh dear. Yes. <laughs> that almost yes, didn't. she did. Yes, she did. <laughs> she must, I'm watching the video. She must have done it pretty forcefully because the bear like fell. Yeah. The way he fell backwards, she had to have pushed him pretty hard. And it is brown in the video. It might be a black bear that's just brown, but I well, don't think it's a Kodiak or a, a grizzly or anything like that. Why didn't she use her right to bear arms? Brad is grinning from <laughs> ear to ear right now. <laughs> oh dear, that was very disappointing. That I think that might have been worse than my that was my earlier for the massive eye roll I got when I started my Twittery section. <laughs> Twittery. <laughs> okay, let's move on to our fun topic for the day. We are recording on May fourth. Star Wars. May the fourth be with you. Who is a Star Wars fan in this room? Okay, I, so I love all things. Brad, space. Matt, Hayden, yeah or nay? No, not really. Okay. I watched a couple of them, but. Other than that, no, not really. Okay. So this Matt must have been the one to include this as our fun topic. Uh, I did not include Brad. This. I didn't. Hayden? Why would I I Who did it? I don't know. Cameron? Not, not me. Who who <laughs> put that there as our fun topic? I bet it was Daniel. Oh my gosh. Let's look through the window at him. He's, He's not, not paying attention. Wow. If it was none of us at this table, it had to be Daniel or maybe Holly snuck in there. But and did none it. of y'all are, are, are sassing me right now. None of you really put this down. Mac, I did not write it on. I did not. I did not. <laughs> Got it. Okay. I believe you. I believe you. I am displeased with the recent performance of the Star Wars franchise. So I would not have put that down. Okay. Although I will say I enjoyed The Mandalorian. Yeah. The first season was good. Again, I feel like The Mandalorian was more of a meme than an actual show because everyone was just <laughs> posting on Twitter the pictures of Baby Yoda. <laughs> That's what made the show popular. Like, Baby Yoda, Baby Yoda. <laughs> I need my plushie. Is that what Baby Yoda says? No, I don't know. <laughs> they sold a lot of merch, though, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Whoever wrote this, it is pretty funny that we have a fun topic that no, no. one has anything to say about. It just appeared. Just emerged from the night. It did. Well, that was a great fun topic. Well, if you want. I feel like if I had a bit of come prepared for this, I'd have had a lot more material. It was the shortest fun topic ever. Of all time. If you, if you want something related to it, uh, the, quote, Death Star Bill just passed out of the Senate Business and Commerce. What is the Death Star Committee? Bill? That is uh, Chairman Burroughs' preemption bill. Uh, there was oh. a, uh, I think, a DMN cartoon that called it the Death Star Bill. That's and a good segue. So, that is moderately so, you know, funny. There's the Star Wars tie. Mm-hmm. Hayden insert, gives you a C plus. <laughs> insert the uh, you know the Darth Vader theme music. I did see where uh, some of the movie theaters were playing some of the old old Star Wars oh, nice. movies. So that might be pretty cool to go check out if you've never seen it on the big screen. Oof, they're so good. The originals are so good. I'm a huge original trilogy fan maybe rob wrote it on there i don't know why he wasn't one of our suspects earlier yes it could have totally been rob i bet it was rob it does it feels like a rob thing too but it also feels like daniel i think i think it's 50 50 in my mind between those two okay folks well i hope you've just enjoyed this uh delight of a fun topic with all of our (laughs) all of our opinions and thoughts on star wars okay do you have a favorite star wars movie of the ones you have seen empire hands down oh yeah is that the one that's with the, fifth the little one. teddy bears? No, the that's Ewoks. Six. They're not teddy bears. They're Ewoks. That's Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Okay, so Empire. Empire. Empire Strikes Back. Empire's fifth one, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that the one? Wait, which one is that? Were they on the snow planet? Snow planet. Oh, and he, okay. Uh, yeah, for, yeah, for a, a Star Wars geek, you know. Well, there's so mm-hmm. many And he called them. them teddy bears. I knew that they were called Ewoks. i think we have a closet star wars nerd over here kind of a little bit okay well yeah you did retweet a texas park and wildlife tweet earlier with some names of some star wars planets and i do know how to pronounce the names of those star wars planets because i had a little brother um okay folks thank you so much for bearing with us we hope you have a wonderful week and we'll catch you next week and may the fourth be with you there you go thank you to everyone for listening if you enjoy our show Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want more of our stories, subscribe to The Texan at thetexan.news. Follow us on social media for the latest in Texas politics and send any questions for our team to our mailbag by DMing us on Twitter or shooting an email to editor at thetexan.news. 
We are funded entirely by readers and listeners like you. So thank you again for your support. Tune in next week for another episode of our weekly roundup. God bless you and God bless Texas.